We continue now with the story of David and Goliath as it is shared with us in 1 Samuel, the 17th chapter. Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a bronze helmet on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. David strapped Saul's sword on the armor, and he tried in vain to walk, for he was not used to them. Then David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I'm not used to them. So David removed them. Then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the wadi and put them in his shepherd's bag in the pouch. His sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. The Philistine came on and drew near to David and his uh, shield-bearer in front of him. When the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. The Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the wild animals of the field. But David said to the Philistine, You come to me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This very day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the Philistine army this very day to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the earth, so that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not save by sword or spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. When the Philistine drew nearer to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. David put his hand in his bag, took out a stone, slung it, and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So it's a well-known story. It's one that I'm sure we've all heard many, many times. And, and I'm sure it's familiar not only to us, but those outside the walls of the church. Because this story has, has made its way into popular culture in so many different ways. It, it's a source for poems and for music, not just in the church, but also secular music as well. There are so many famous pieces of art that depict this story, uh, from, from paintings to, to tapestries that hang in places like the Washington National Cathedral. Uh, there are even sculptures. It's probably the, one of, if not the most famous sculpture of all time, is the one by Michelangelo, who is of David moments before this final fight, slinging over his shoulder rock in his hand. And, and then, of course, you can't be a fan of sports <laughs> without having heard this phrase, David and Goliath, used as a short-term way of saying a, an individual or a team is facing insurmountable odds. I mean, this has, been, this has been used from throughout history, you know, for college football games, for U.S. Olympic teams, for, you know, race ho horse races from way back uh, over 100 years ago. I mean, time and time again, this phrase has been used, David and Goliath. And so I imagine that whether you are familiar with the book of 1 Samuel, whether you know about the conflict between the Israelites and the Philistines, everyone has to have some idea about the story of David and Goliath. And so for that reason, I was actually hesitant to preach upon this scripture. I mean, because we're so familiar with this story, I'm sure we know everything about it. Why even spend any time with it? But then I looked back and I realized that in my over seven years now, here at Stillwater First Church, I've never preached upon this scripture. And then for my own curiosity, I went back and looked, and in my three years at Wakita and Manchester before coming here, I never preached upon this scripture. And I realized that my own bias of thinking everyone's heard this story time and time again, I've never actually taken the opportunity to preach on it. So I decided, well, why not? <laughs> Let's go ahead. I mean, how many of us listen to songs we love on repeat or return to a favorite book or movie uh, that give us comfort? And I don't know about you, but often when I do those things, when I return to something that I love, I find something new within it. 
So that's what I want us to do today. I want us to turn to the story of David and Goliath and hear it once again. We've heard it read. I'm going to share the story with you once more. And let us see if there's something new that you might pick up that you've never noticed before. The story is, is, is an epic told in the style of, uh, of Homer. And, and it has full of characterization and, and with imagery. And it is told almost in three acts, if you will. You, you heard Act 2 and 3 read to you this morning, but it actually begins in the opening verses of chapter 17 with the first act kind of the setup. The second act being David's arrival at the camp and his offer to face the Philistine. And of course, the third act ending with the battle. So let's look at this story once again together. And as we do, let's begin with a word of prayer. Gracious and loving God, we come to you today feeling often like the Israelites in today's story, uh, dismayed and afraid at the world around us, the giants that we face personally, the giants that we face collectively. But God, we pray that just like with David, that you would be with us here today, that you'd be with us every day as we go forth and live out our faith. God, it is my prayer that you would descend your Holy Spirit down upon us. Fill me with your spirit. Use me as a vessel. Speak through me to share with each of us your message of truth and grace this day. Amen. So the Philistines' land was bordered by water to the west and the land of Judah, the land of the Israelites, to, their, to the east. This kind of the southwest portion of the land of Judah. And they have been in constant conflict with the Israelites uh, since they emerged in the promised land. Uh, they have had many battles back and forth. There have been wins and losses on both sides. But in the book of Samuel, we see that it has moved to all-out war. At the beginning of our story, the 17th chapter, in the first verse, we hear about how the Philistines have begun to move, encroach into the Israelites' land. They've taken, made camp, set up camp on a mountainside in the southwest part of Judah. And to come out to meet them, we have uh, the King Saul brings out his armies. And they come to a mountaintop on the opposite side. And they're having this stare down across these two mountains with a valley in between them. And emerging from the Philistine side is a giant of a man named Goliath. And we are told that he comes out to be their champion. Now the word champion uh, is, is that we translate as champion is for a Hebrew word that literally means one who stands between. So Goliath comes down from the mountaintop of the Philistines to stand in the valley, to stand between the Philistines and the Israelites as their champion. And the book is extremely descriptive about this Goliath. We're told that he is over six cubits in a span, which means that he is well over eight feet tall. We are told about his bronze armor, his helmet, his breastplate, the chain mail. We are told about the javelin that rests between his shoulders. We are told about the spear that is in his hand and the sword that is at his waist. He has so much armor and so many pieces of, so, many wep so much weaponry that he has to have a shield bearer to go before him to carry his massive shield in front of him. And Goliath takes a stand right there in between the Philistines and the Israelites. And he calls out to the Israelites and he says to them, Choose for you a man. Ironic foreshadowing here. Choose for you a man who will come and fight with me. Choose for you a man and if he fights me and kills me, then we will be your servants. But if I fight him and I kill him, you will be our servants. Send me a man so that we might fight. We're told that the Israelites are afraid. They're filled with fear and dismay. And so is their King Saul. They don't know what they're going to do. Meanwhile, back in the town of Bethlehem, there's a young boy we're introduced to named David. And we're told that he is the eighth son of a man named Jesse. He's the youngest. And that his three oldest brothers have gone off to fight in the war. They've gone off to serve in King Saul's army. Now we know that in, of course, to, uh, according to Israelite law, you had to be 20 or older to go and to serve in the military. So his three oldest brothers are at least 20 or older. So that probably puts David, this boy, around young teens. Probably no more. He couldn't be older than 16. So he's in his young teens likely. And he is a shepherd, we're told. So his job is to stay home and to look after his father's sheep. But one day, Jesse sends for David and says, David, I want you to go out to the camp. Take some wheat and some bread. Take it to your brothers. And make sure they're well fed. 
Not only that, but here are ten wheels of cheese. <laughs> Give them to the commander of the army. You know, he wants them to be in the good graces of their commander. Then he also tells them, and hurry back and tell me how they fare. Bring back some token from them. You hear the pain and the worry in his voice, don't you? Any parent who's ever sent a son or a daughter off to armed conflict has to know what that's like. He's afraid for his boys. He's sending David to go feed them, check on them, come back and tell me that they're okay. And so David does as he's told. He, he goes out to the camp where they are and he sees this scene that's taking place. These two armies that are positioned on these mountains. And we are told that it's been 40 days. 40 days. Morning and night. Goliath emerges from the Philistine army into the valley. Takes his stand and issues his challenge. So David, he, he, he gives the food to his brothers. He, he begins to ask questions though as he sees what's going on. He asks questions of his brothers. He asks questions of the others who are there. He says, what's going to be done about this? I mean, who's going to face this man? What will be done for the person who does? Like, what's going to happen here? And then we come to the part that Ed read for us at the opening of our service today. King Saul summons David to his presence. We don't really know why. Uh, maybe Saul is, is wondering why is a kid here in the midst of the army? You know, what's he doing here? He shouldn't be here. Bring him to me. Maybe David's questioning is starting to stir up the army, making them nervous and a little uncomfortable. You know, what are we going to do? We don't know. What's the answer? And, and so Saul wants to get David away from them. But for whatever the reason, Saul has David come to him. And then David says these words. He says, do not let anyone's hearts fail. For I, your servant, will go and meet and fight this Philistine. Now Saul understandably says, you can't do that. <laughs> There's no way you can do that. You're just a boy. And, and this man has been fighting, has been a warrior since his youth. But here David is and he's offering to go and be Israel's champion. He's offering to be, go and be the one who stands between the Philistines and the people of Israel and their country. And so David, he says to Saul, he says, I, your servant, I'm used to being a shepherd for my father, Jesse. And as my father's shepherd, there'd be times when a bear or a lion would come and take one of the lambs from the flock. And I would go after that lion. I would go after that bear and I would strike it and save the lamb from its mouth. And if the animal turned against me, I would grab it by the jaw and I would kill it. It will be the same for this Philistine. For he has defied the armies of the living God. And the same God who saved me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will save me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul can't argue with him. So he says, go and the Lord be with you. But before he does... <laughs> He tells him to go, but then he says, wait. <laughs> now, you can't go out there as a shepherd, obviously. You've got to go out there as a warrior. Saul gives him his own helmet. <laughs> Saul gives him his breastplate. Gives him his sword. But David can't move. David tries to progress. He tries to go forward. And he, in fact, he has to say to Saul, I can't, I am unable to walk. <laughs> and so he removes the armor of a warrior he removes the armor of a king and he picks up the staff of a shepherd and he makes his descent. Along the way, he stops at a riverbed. He picks up five stones smoothed out by the water. He places them in his pouch. He steps into the valley. Now Goliath sees David and you heard his response, right? He is angry. He is infuriated. He, he, he says, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And he curses David. And he threatens him. And he says, come to me. And I will feed your flesh to the birds of the air and the wild animals of the field. But David doesn't allow himself to be intimidated. Instead he says to Goliath and the Philistines, you come to me with javelin and sword and spear but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts 
the God of Israel whose armies you have defied this day. And I will prevail against you. God will deliver you into my hands so that all the world will know that there is a God in Israel. And this entire assembly will know that God does not save by sword and spear. For the battle is the Lord's and he will deliver you into my hands. Goliath is the first to make the first move. He begins to come at David and as soon as he does, David runs to him to meet him. Reaching into his pouch, placing a stone in his sling, letting it loose. And it hits, David, it hits Goliath right in the forehead. An opening in his helmet. And Goliath falls face down to the ground. David goes and stands over Goliath, removes his sword, Goliath's sword, and kills him. And that's the story. <laughs> Did it go how you imagined? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you remember it, right? <laughs> I doubt it ended any differently for you. Uh, I doubt anyone was, <gasps> David won? <laughs> you know the story. You've heard it before. But... I don't know if you're like me, as I read over this and I dived into it over the past couple weeks and spent time with it, what stood out to me wasn't the Israelites and the Philistines on the mountainside. It wasn't Goliath. It, it wasn't the David one. What stood out to me were the details. Did you notice how Goliath is described? It's huge. And, and he's described by his armor. He's described by the number of weapons that he carries. That he has so much that someone has to carry his own shield for him. You know, that he's got that much armor and weaponry. He, he, he's described and he professes as himself as, as this warrior, as this champion. And where is his faith and his trust? It's in himself. It's in his might. It's in his armor and his weapons. How is David described? David's described as a shepherd. He describes himself as a servant. One who would go out and save even one lost sheep carried away by an animal. So here we have two individuals who, yes, there's a big size difference, but there's far more than that. One sees himself as a warrior who seeks to impose his will upon others through brute force and strength. And another who sees himself as a servant sent to protect and to help. Both are champions, but entirely different types of champions. When is God first mentioned in this story? It's not until David arrives. I find that interesting. I mean, maybe they just left it out of the story. But you've got to think if the people of Israel, they're in filled with fear and dismay and they're up on this mountain, you would think they'd all be praying to God, God, please help us. God, save us. God, protect us from this conflict and this war that we're entering into. But we hear none of that. Saul, the king of the Hebrew people, the, the children of God as they proclaim, you would think that Saul would be praying to God. God, help deliver us. God, give me guidance. God, give me direction as we enter into this conflict. What would you have me do? You would think that the king of the people who call themselves children of God would want to know what the God who they're named for desires of them. But we hear none of that. It's not until David arrives on the scene. And David looks at this situation. And he sees Goliath's threat of enslavement and death and violence. He sees it not as just a threat to the Israelite people, but he sees it as an affront to God. David looks at this situation and, and he sees and he has faith and hope that God will stand against this oppressor. He, he believes that God will be with him as he seeks to humbly serve him and, and to care for and to defend the powerless. David believes that God is there with him. It is David. He is the first and the only one who in a time of despair and conflict chooses to turn first to God. Another detail that stood out to me is what does David take with him into battle? I mean, it was so interesting that here he has this conversation with Saul and, and Saul finally gives in. Okay, I'm going to give in to this unorthodox idea of sending a child out to battle this giant of a man. But then he still wants to, him to battle him by orthodox means. <laughs> still, by the way, the world says that battle should take place. That you should, you know, fight power with power. Here, take strong armor. Take the best sword that we have. Take all of this with you. And, and what happens? David, he, he can't move. 
He can't even progress. He can't go forward out there to meet the giant. It's not until he takes off the armor, until he takes off the expectations of Saul, until he takes off the expectations of the world and goes out there and faces Goliath as himself. It's not until then that he's able to go forward. It's not, until, it's not with the armor of Saul. It's not with weapons and armor that he uses to fight the giant. Instead, David uses the gifts that God has given him. He faces Goliath as himself. Now let's talk about that battle and the speech that David gives. I don't, obviously, David is not a pacifist. <laughs> but at the same time, though, I don't think this story is an approval of any type of violence or using force to, to fight against others, as that being a, a first uh, uh, choice or even God's desire for us. Uh, what I think David sees here is a bully. David sees a bully who is threatening and seeks to oppress his people, who thinks to lead the Philistines to take over their land, to enslave their families. And David sees that this person, needs, someone needs to stand up against him. And no one is willing to. And so David decides to do so. And though time and time again, Goliath has the opportunity to step down, to step back, he will not. And so David decides that words aren't going to work here, that the only thing that can be used is the force, is the force that he knows and knows how to use, force to strengthen his strength to stop him. And for me, and probably for many of us, that makes me uncomfortable, that he uses violence to stop Goliath. But to be honest, I don't know that I could say I would do any different if it was my wife, my son, my family, my community being oppressed or threatened. And so while obviously David isn't a pacifist, I also think it's really important for us though to understand this and, and to talk about the speech that he gives to Goliath and all those who are listening. Especially that final statement that he makes. You heard it. He, he's there standing, he's facing Goliath and he is confident that he will emerge victorious. And he says, when I do, not only will the world know that there's a God in Israel, but this whole assembly, Goliath, the Philistines, the Israelites, this whole assembly will know that God does not save by sword and spear, as David has brought none with him to the battle. I believe that's a speech for everyone who's listening. I think he's talking to the Israelites. Israelites, you've come to this battle. You've sought to wage this war. You, you think that there is power in kings and in might and in swords and armor. And, and you seek to operate on the world's terms. But God has called you to be someone different. You are children of God. You're called to be a different kind of people. You've got to imagine that David is thinking to himself the laws that are contained in the Old Testament, especially, especially the, the ones that Jesus himself says all the others hang upon. Deuteronomy, which tells us that above all, we are to love God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And in Leviticus, where God commands his people to not hold on to grudges, do not seek vengeance, but instead love your neighbor as yourself. And I think David is thinking to himself, God desires something more of us. And to the Philistines and to Goliath, I think David is professing a powerful truth. God stands in opposition to those who seek to oppress who those who use their power for self-seeking measures, for those who seek to impose their will upon others just for their own benefit. God stands against it. And David is saying to Goliath and Philistines, you, like all people, have a chance to turn away. And we as Christians know this better than anyone else, don't we? I mean, what is the crux of our faith if it's not that God chooses to bring about salvation not through wars and through armies and through power and through might, but God instead chooses to bring about salvation through grace, through forgiveness, for, through self-sacrificing love? <laughs> what is the story of Jesus on the cross and his resurrection if it is not that? We as well as anyone ought to know what David says is true. That salvation for David, for the Israelites, for the Philistines comes not by a sword. So in the end, what are we to make of this story? Is it just a nice, wonderful story from the church's history, from the Old Testament, of how youth, even youths can triumph in the face of adversity? Or is there a more powerful truth here? 
for each of us today? I think it's the latter. I think the story provides for us a framework, if you will. As you face giants in your life, personally or communally, in, our, in your home, in your places of work, in the community, in the world, I think this story provides for us a framework about how God calls us to respond. Because they're out there. Bullies are out there. From the playground all the way to the world stage. They're out there. And more often than not, they come in all shapes and all sizes as individuals or groups who seek to use their influence, their power to coerce, to oppress, sometimes even forcefully and violently force others into submission. And more often than not, the people who suffer the most are the poor, the powerless, the young, the aging. They're the ones who suffer the most. So I think the story is telling us that if you want to be a follower of God, seek his will first, like David. Seek to place your faith first in God and seek what does God desire of me? What does God desire of us? And then understand that God just might be calling you to be a champion for yourself, probably for someone else. To be someone who's willing to go and stand between and then you may be thinking to yourself, but come on, I'm not a warrior. I don't have an armor. I can't wield a sword. But the story tells us you don't have to. That God calls you to be a champion, to face the giants in your life and the giants of this world, not with sword and with shield and with armor, but to face them with, with what God has already given you. Face them with your gifts and with your graces. Maybe you have the eloquency and the words that you can give voice to the voiceless in your life and in your community and in our world. Maybe you have the strength to build and to create and to provide a home for those who have never known one. Maybe you have the resources, financial and otherwise, to help bring about God's kingdom in our little corner of the world. Maybe you have the creativity and the ingenuity to come up with solutions to the systems that have oppressed and have systematically caused pain and hurt to people in our world. Maybe you have hands and arms that can provide comfort and love to a child who has never known either. There's a lot of giants out there. You know them. You've experienced them. Great and small. And I know sometimes it's easy to be afraid. To be terrified. To be dismayed. But what this story tells us is that sometimes God is calling us to face the giants, but not with sword and armor, but instead with God's help that maybe all it takes is just a well-placed stone to bring them down. So when everyone else around you is throwing up their arms and saying, we're all doomed, maybe God is saying, you have the words. Maybe you have the strength the idea and the imagination. Maybe you have just the touch to slay the giant of anger, oppression, loneliness, despair that someone in your life is facing today. Who knows? Maybe God is calling you today to be a shepherd, to be a servant, to step out into the valley and to offer the world the grace, the gifts, the love that God has given you. Amen.